Prestigious History of Bangladesh. I'm Avanti Harun, I'll be presenting this. I'm a faculty of General Education Department at the University of River Las Bangladesh. So when we talk about the religious history of Bangladesh, it takes us to a much way back because we are not sure when it started. But the recent phenomena like recent archaeological and genetic evidence suggest that the inhabitation in this area started long ago. So if you know about the history of Homo sapiens, the scientific name of human beings that has started around 200,000 years ago, and the Homo sapiens, they first appeared in Africa. They started to leave Africa through the horns of Africa and all the way through the Pan Arab Peninsula, arrived at Indian subcontinent around 80,000 to 60,000 years back. And from this way, the other way inhabited other parts of the world and moved forward. So who were they? We have no idea because not too many evidence were found from that period. Only recent genetic studies prove that some parts of South India and some parts of Bangladesh have that genetic evidence that the people have familiarities and similarities with this prehistoric Homo sapiens. But however, the little evidence and relics we find that, that suggest that the people of modern day uh, Shantal Munda Ora or the Austroasiatic people, their ancestors were possibly the first Homo sapiens or inhabitants of this land. So when we think about that, we don't have any evidence that how they used to live and what they used to believe. But the evidence suggests that possibly they were sort of animistic in their religious belief. What is animism then? Animism is a kind of belief in a form of natural and supernatural forces, all, all uh, in different objects. For example, you can think that there is a force for cloud or rain, there is a force for forest. So this type of thoughts that there are certain objects or uh, uh, forces or supernatural spirits are living everywhere and that they have certain capacities to do good and bad or to control the nature, that is a kind of animistic, be animistic belief. And the people who adhere to this belief are called the animist. So it is assumed that the people of this land, the original inhabitants, possibly were animist in their belief, but the evidence is not proved. And that's a long time ago, as I say, the 60,000 to 80,000 years back. But we don't know what happened in between because we are not having enough archaeological evidence. If we once get the evidence, maybe we have to revise our history. So the archaeological evidence we get here, that goes back around 2800 BCE. That is around 5,000 years back when the Harappa civilization was there. It was a great civilization, one of the largest river valley civilization that was at the height, uh, at the peak of their time when it was around, you know, 2000 to 1500 BC. So the Harappan civilization developed and flourished in the northwestern part of India and also which is now part of Punjab and, pa and some parts of Sindh in Pakistan. Many evidence were found. They were a very developed civilization. They had huge uh, architectural structures. They had uh, very developed plumbing techniques, city life, and very developed agriculture, but we're not sure about their religious beliefs. But some evidence found that because one of the important thing is that the writings the that were found in Harappa civilization were not totally translated. It is, the meanings are not yet discovered. So if people or the archaeologists are able to discover the meanings of Harappan writings, maybe we can know more about the civilization. However, from the evidence, they came to the understanding that there was a form of worshipping mother goddess. It was also very common in many prehistoric civilizations, even in the prehistoric period, the worshipping of mother goddess, a form of mother goddess idea there. And also there was some kind of idea of tree of life, idea of the tree of life, how life spread over other parts. And uh, there was a seals of people or acacia tree that were also found. And also it is assumed that they were familiar with uh, forms of yoga, which is the modern day yoga, as we all know, or meditation. And also some statues and figures were found which resemble with the later part 
who is the Lord Shiva, who arrived, who later uh, emerged as Lord Shiva, who was in the form of, his another form is called Pushupati. So maybe they had a kind of the idea of uh, God worship of Lord Shiva. But it is not properly described, but there are also different forms of magic was there and uh, the dead bodies were cremated. So we can assure that they were, they had certain forms of belief. And it was also important to remember that the uh, civilization has spread over a vast region. So maybe different regions have their different beliefs and forms of deities. We are not sure about that. So when the, this Harappan civilization of the Indus Valley came to an end around 1500 BC, at that time, it is also important to remember that there are also the Austroasiatic speakers and local inhabitants are also there. But it was kind of took a shake when the Aryan or Aryan speakers came to this land or rose to prominence. It was around 1500 BC in the northwestern part of India, the Aryans settled down. The Aryans changed the culture of this land in many ways because they not only came with the uh, in the form of conquering, but they also changed the religious belief and the cultures of this land. How? This period from 1500 BC to 6th century BC is called the Vedic period. The Aryans, the language they used to speak later took the form of Sanskrit. And they also introduced their belief and also took the cultural beliefs from this land and that amalgamated a particular tradition in the form of a particular tradition for which reason the belief later took the name, the traditional religion, that is the traditional in Sanskrit or Bengali term that is called Sanatana or Shanatan Dharma. So what was that? Let's get back to 1500 BC. At that time, the religious performances or the rituals were mainly performed by the priest who were called the Brahmins. They took the sole authority and lead on religion and religious belief. So this religion was called Brahmanism, mainly Brahmanism because it derived from the term Brahmins or Brahmans who used to take the lead. And, uh, but also they introduced, the Brahmins also introduced a form of division of labor, which is called the Varnashram. That means that the Brahmins who were supposed to derive from the head of the creator Brahma, so therefore they are supposed to perform the task of uh, knowledge and rituals and the Kshatriyas or the Khatriyas who derive from the arms of the Brahma, so their task is to go for warfare or they are the warriors, kings and the Vaishyas who derive from his thighs, they are the business people and the rest mainly the peasants, they were called the Shudras. So this Varnashram system were created at this time and the Brahmins were the uh, main leaders of ritual performances and activities. Major books, which is also the oldest, supposed to be the oldest book of the world, Vedas were created at this time. We find the Vedas from this time. The oldest book of the world is the Rig Veda, which is the oldest Veda as well. And there are also some other Vedas, altogether four Vedas, Rig Veda, Jirju Veda, Sam Veda and Atharva Veda. All these Vedas can contain the essence of Hinduism. But there are also other epics, Ramayana and Mahabharata were also compiled at this time. And uh, it, uh, not too many written evidences were found from that time, but it, uh, the archaeologists and historians argue that there was a huge importance on the ritual performances. Fire has a very important role to play uh, on the rituals and also there were animal sacrifices it was very very common in different yajnas which is called the jagga or yajnas and also there were certain gods we find in the vedic literature like indra agni varun surya those gods were worshipped but not in the forms of the statues as we see nowadays even in the Ramayana and Mahabharata, statue worship were not that common. It is assumed that the statue worship were uh, the derivement of local culture. The Aryans were mainly pagans and they used to worship different forms. For example, Indra was the god of uh, the king of gods, but he was also the god of lightning. Varun was a god of rain and you know underworld. Uh, Agni was a god of fire. So different natural forces were worshipped but not in the forms of the statues. 
these gods are also revered today, but not their statues are worshipped the way now the other gods are worshipped. However, this Vedic period continued up to uh, 6th century BC and uh, it is also important that by this time the Aryans moved from the northeast to the eastward, taking the roots on the uh, on the taking the roots of the Ganges. They moved eastward and southward. So the civilization, the Aryan civilization, moved eastward. But at the same time, they had also adopted many local cultures. So the language Sanskrit by that time contained many local elements from Prakrito language. At the same time, the Prakrito language also contained different elements from the Sanskrit language. So. With the movement of the Aryans, the areas also Aryanized. That means that Aryan culture were developed in these areas and also local cultures somehow penetrated the Aryan culture. And along with the Vedic Ved Vedas, they developed many other literature. For example, the Puranas, different Puranas were developed at that time. And some parts of Mahabharata, the large, longest book of the world, has been taken as a very religious and holy book like Bhagavad Gita, one chapter of Mahabharata. So this is how the Aryan culture or Aryan religion spread from northwest to the east and southern parts of India. But it is also important to note that the local cultures were also there. So what happened at that time? Different local gods were gradually being adopted and improvised within the Hinduistic traditions. Who are they? For example, maybe some scholars write good, maybe Jagannath was a local god, which is a very important god in Urissa. Later, he was taken as a form of uh, Shiva and uh, the creator Brahma. Similarly, uh, if we see later paths, in many, many later paths in Bengal, like many other local goddesses like Durga or Uma or Kali, those were maybe local goddesses, but they were somehow uh, accommodated within Hinduism in the forms of the wives of Lord Shiva. Even Shiva himself was appropriated from Harappan tradition. He was not among the important Vedic gods, but later on he was also adopted as a main form, one of the main forms of Brahma, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. Three major traditions developed throughout this period. One tradition is the Brahman of one tradition is the Shaivism that who are the worshippers of Shiva. Second is the uh, Shaktaism who combined the who worship the combined force of Purusha and Prakriti. And third is the Vaishnavism who worship the nurturing form of the Brahma, that is Vishnu, who worship the form of Vishnu. They focus more on love and devotion. However, 6th century is a major breakthrough. 6th century BCE is a major breakthrough to this. Why is that? 6th century BC is also considered to be the age of ideas. Why? Many people, many important people of that time, they came up with the new ideas that kind of shook the conventional idea of religion and priesthood and also the rituals. Of course, the four and foremost person of this is Siddhartha Gautama, who is later known as Gautam Buddha. He was born in a a uh, warrior and king family. Later on, he gave up all his kingdom and everything and he took ascetism to find the way, to find out the way to have salvation from suffering. And there's huge stories about Siddhartha Gautama, how he reached the truth. So he tried to find the truth and the truth, reaching the truth is called the Nirvana, the ultimate salvation. Gautam Buddha was patronized by that times one of the local kings, Bimbisara, the king of Magadha, and he traveled around different Janapadas. At that time, the northern part of India, a uh, middle part of India also, divided into 16 Mahajanapadas, 16 localities. And he traveled through, but uh, it gained popularity among many people, like those, because it was a great uh, attack on caste system on the dominance of the Brahmanism and also the rituals like animal sacrifice and also the soldiers, the elites, they were very much inclined to his religiosity and these new ideas of religion. But uh, that actually got major breakthrough. I mean, Buddhism got major breakthrough after two centuries that we'll, we will get back. And also among others, there were Mahavir Jaina 
who introduced the idea of Jainism. In fact, it is argued by the scholars that Buddhism and Jainism are kind of revival of an old India tradition, which is called Shramanism, that is ascetism. The difference is that both Buddhism and Jainism focus on the sufferings of life. They say that human life cannot escape suffering. Life is full of suffering. Jivon dukhmoy. But what are the way outs? Buddhism refers to some source of salvation. There are ways out. On the other hand, Jainism says that there is no way out. It's better to embrace that suffering. So these are the big differences. But these two religions became immensely popular at that time because uh, at that time when the groups and tribes were fighting against each other. So these ideas came up with a new idea of you know, peace, coexistence, harmony and the meaninglessness of life. So this is how and also there were some other religions like Ajivikas which were uh, one of the important person of that time, Mokkali Goshal. So there are many other traditions but these two got prominence at that time and which later sustained even. Um, and also Brahmanism of course was there. So after this period there was a period of empire building that happened around 3rd century BCE and the first big empire of that time was the Mauryan Empire and one of the greatest king of Mauryan Empire was Chandragupta Maurya you might have heard that who fought against Alexander and uh, Alexander quite highly uh, sp spoke of more Chandragupta Maurya Alexander and his historians but later Chandragupta Maurya's grandson Ashoka who changed the course of religion a religious demography in India and the subcontinent. He embraced the teachings of Buddha and embarked on a systematic program to spread Buddhist rituals and Buddhist principles all over. He established many monasteries. He sent missionaries throughout southern parts like to Sri Lanka, to eastern parts like Myanmar, to you know China and other parts. And this is how Buddhism spread all over. And it, it is said that if Ashoka had not been there, maybe Buddhism could have remained as a smaller sect. But however, due to Ashoka and his patronization, Buddhism became a big religion in terms of population. Later on, around the first century, when the Kushanas came uh, in the northern and uh, western part of India, who ruled from northeastern India to the Central Asia, a big area in any count, they were a huge patron of Buddhism. So Buddhism were not only limited, was not only limited within Indian subcontinent that spread even to the western parts of Asia, even up to Egypt, even up to Greece, as it was said, and there are evidences for that. So at that time, Brahmanism was kind of in a back foot. On the other hand, Buddhism became very popular, gained popularity many monasteries established and also many universities. You might have heard that Takshashila, Takshashila or Nalanda University, Bikram Shila, these were all called Bihars, many Bihars were established and Bihar was a center for, the, for this reason. This uh, uh, part of India was called Bihar, which is now the modern day Bihar. So after this period, there was a rise of Brahmanism, Brahmanistic tradition but not in the previous form, in a different form. That was the period of the Gupta Empire from the 4th century to 6th century CE, that is the common era. And that is considered to be the golden age of India by many scholars that, okay, at that time, the Brahmanism was again in their peak and many traditions, many cultural uh, forms developed, like, for example, Sh Shivaism or Shivites and the uh, uh, Vaishnavs and also the Shaktas, they flourished in different parts of India, many temples were built, many cultural traditions. The way actually we imagine ancient India, the image of ancient India were built at that time. So Gupta Empire was a major breakthrough but also it is important to note that at that time many other, I mean before and after Gupta Empire there were many other local kingdoms and those kingdoms also contributed to the flourishment of Hinduism. Here I would like you to mention another noteworthy point that is the 
through the sea route, they are also the transaction with Arab world and also like, uh, you know, uh, Egypt and other parts. So whenever we talk about India, we only refer to the people, you know, Hinduism or Buddhism or Jainism. But evidence suggests that also before 6th century, there were even the uh, inhabitation of Christians and Jews in the southern parts of India and also some parts of, I mean, the subcontinent, some parts of Bengal as well. Later, they only concentrated in some parts, but there were some transactions, so people started to live there. However, and after the decline of Gupta Empire, there was a period of chaos that different kingdoms came up, but they were not building that big empires like the Guptas or the Mauryas, but there were ups and downs. The major breakthrough came through the arrival of Islam. Islam first came in the 8th century uh, with the, uh, Muhammad bin Qasim when he conquered Sindh, but he later left. But when we talk about Islam, we actually refer to mostly to the conquerors, the military conquerors. But Islam came through different ways, the land routes, the sea routes, and also by the Sufis and the missionaries. Through the sea routes, as I said, there were long, long ago, there were transactions with the Arab world. So the Arab merchants and traders, they not only settled down here, but they also traversed the many trade networks that connected the entire Asia and also the Europe. And they settled down in different southern and east western parts of India and also in Bengal. So these people were there. They didn't come up with the idea of conquering or didn't come up with the idea of uh, settlement, settlement, not only settlement, but preaching religion. They settled down and they had their own community. They married the local girls, they, so they converted, the local people converted. That happened with a slow, smooth process. But when the conquerors came, that took uh, around 13th century, when Muhammad Guri from Central Asia, they conquered Delhi Sultanate. So this is how Islam came. Uh, through the land routes. But along with the conquerors, then one after another, the Turks, the uh, Patans, the Mughals, they came one after another. But along with these conquerors, there came a number of Sufis who from distant areas, not only from Arabia, but also from Iraq, Iran, Syria, Yemen, different parts. They came, settled down, and actually they played the most leading and pivotal role to convert the local population to by preaching their simpler philosophies their lifestyles many people got converted to islam and along with this a lot of migration also took place because of the warfare in those parts of the middle east many people migrated they came as a part of the military force, they came as a part of the administrative jobs, but they came. So this is how the demography started to change. So along with Brahmanism, along with Hinduism, Islam emerged as a major religion of this area. And by that time, Buddhism gradually get uh, marginalized in the peripheries. More it flourished on the eastern parts or northeastern, northwestern, northeastern parts and also forest, but not in the center of the subcontinent. Uh, so this is the background of the flourishment of religions in the subcontinent. So now if we look at Bangladesh, what happened in the Bangladesh or modern day Bengal, as I said that uh, we, are, we didn't get much evidence of uh, religious belief in this place, but as it is assumed that uh, the original inhabitants of this place were Austro-Asiatic speakers, so it is assumed that they were kind of believer in animism. Secondly, uh, the Aryanization took place in this area around 6th century BCE. So uh, before that, Hinduism was not that familiar in this region. After that, uh, even when Hinduism or the Brahmanism got introduced, the dominant form of Brahmanism was not that prominent here, like the way it was established in the northern part of India or the, which is called the Aryavarta. It was out of the Aryavarta belt. So much more local traditions were there. Maybe some philosophies, some things were taken. And also it is important to note that even in Hinduism, the 6th century BCE, uh, different 
ideas came up like not only even within Brahmanism, for example, Shankaracharya, they came up even the atheist philosophies of Charvaka, materialist philosophies of Charvaka came up. And it is assumed that people of this land, the Bengal, they were more into those things instead of getting into the dominant form of Brahmanism. Although these are arguable, but it's still we see that these forms are there. So in the 6th century BCE, we see different local cities like Mahasthangar or Pundranagar were there. So here the different forms coexisted, animism or Brahmanism or local any other form coexisted altogether. Buddhism also went through Bengal because it, Bengal is the gateway to India and Far East. It's a kind of gateway. Mm -hmm. So when Ashoka sent his ambassadors to Far East, many of them maybe had taken the route to move through Bengal. So Buddhism also got kind of familiarity here. But in general, Buddhism became popular when the Pala rule started in the 8th century. The Palas, the reign started around 8th century, 750, uh, BC, 750 CE with uh, Gopala and it sustained for next 400 years. And in any count, it was a big empire, especially during the rule of Dharmapala and Devapala. From Bengal, they ruled up to Kabul or Kandahar of uh, Afghanistan. And uh, later, Devapala even explored eastern parts like Kamrup, which is Assam. He also conquered that area. So in this huge region, Buddhism became popular, very popular. Palas were Buddhist. They invested a lot of, they had a lot of investments to religion, education, and arts. Therefore, many Biharas were established at that time. For example, the Sompur Bihara and other Biharas of the other area of modern day India. And therefore, Buddhism became a domin not only dominant religion, but Bengal became a center of education. Many people used to come here uh, from other parts of the world to receive education. Even there were some local kingdoms here, like the Devas in Kumilla region, in Samatat region. They also established another Bihar, which is Chalbon Bihar in Mainamati. People used to come, students used to come, because these were residential universities. People used to come and they used to uh, stay over there. And there were many renowned scholars of that time, for example, Atish Dipankara, you have heard of his name. And he was so famous that at one point, the king of Tibet, he invited him to uh, Atish Dipankara to go to his place and to stay there. And finally, he died over there. So this is said to be the glorious period of Buddhism uh, because the Palas had invested a lot to contributed a lot to religion and education. And often people argue that this is their the secret of their success will reign for 400 years because they invested not on only military force but also in education and uh, arts and literature. And also many important Bengali literature of that time, Charya Pada developed at that time. But it is, it may be crucial to understand that there is not only one idea of Buddhism, there are different traditions like Theravada, like Hinayana, like uh, Vajrayana, these traditions develop in different parts. And in Bengal, there were many other traditions like Sahajyana, Chakrayana. And it is argued that all these traditions stay together quite peacefully, which is very, you know, unusual in when a dominant religion is there and the kings are from a dominant religion and the Brahmins are also there. Brahmanistic religion, traditions is also there. So this is how, because of the secular policy and more really education friendly approach, the Buddhism developed in this part. Later, after the decline of the Palas, when the Shainas came, they were Orthodox Brahmins from Karnataka. Uh, so they were, it is good that they were quite repressive, although their reign was pretty short, around 100 years. But uh, they did not care about the popularity of the religion or the secular policy. But still, two important kings of Sena uh, reign, Balal Sen and his son Lakshman Shen, they also 
invested on developing Hindu culture or Hindu religiosity. So in Lakshman Chana's court, they were the famous scholars of that time were there, like Halayud Misro or uh, Umapati Dhar, these famous people, even Joydev, the, the famous uh, poet, they were there. So somehow they have important contribution to literature and arts as well. After the Senas, the Muslims came, Muslim conquerors came, but again the Muslim inhabitation in the coastal areas started long before the Muslim conquerors came. Even uh, often it is mentioned that when Bhaktiar Khilji conquered the Bengal in 1204, but long before that the Muslim inhabitation started in this area. However, the first 134 years were full of chaos of the Muslim rule, but when the Sultanate started, in 1338, then the period was quite different because at that time Bengal became independent from Delhi, from the India, I mean, the, from the center of Muslim rule. The so Bengal became independent and they independently developed some policies for the flourishment of the population. And one of the most important policy of that time was secularism. The renowned two sultans of that time, Sultan Ilyas Shah and Sultan Alauddin Hussein Shah, Two were very famous for their secular policy and coexistence of different religious uh, communities and in their encouragement for religious harmony. Alauddin Hussein Shah was uh, in his time, he appointed many Hindu people in his uh, cabinet, his uh, bodyguards, his uh, chief minister, his uh, accountant, all were Hindus. It is important because it is not only to promote the Hindus but also to promote religious harmony. And he also uh, supported in, country, in uh, translating uh, Ramayana to Bangla. That is the, the Ramayana now it is being read all over in Bengal, in Bangla. That is during this period which is when it is translated from Sanskrit to Bangla. And it is a time of the rise of Chaitanya Dev. So you could see that during the Muslim rule also, there was a Vaishnav tradition flourished. There were the flourishment of Hindu traditions and also the tradition of the Islam, of course, was there. So this is the high period when the mass conversion took place. Many Sufis came here and being convinced by their simple way of life, their simpler approach to religiosity, many local people who were the peasants or you know the ethnic people of this region, they got converted. So that is how Islam flourished in this land. Even the Mughal period, after the Sultanate period, the Mughals came, they didn't care much about the, you know, the religious communal disharmony or something. Some people said that Allah Aurangzeb was a uh, repressive, uh, repressive ruler, but however, in Bengal, we didn't see much repressive cases uh, for the minority population or the population of the uh, other religions. It all shifted during the colonial rule. When the colonial rulers, that is the British came, they divided the population in actually for their uh, convenience, they divided the population in different communities. Like caste became prominent at that time. Often people like Nicholas Jacques and others said that the caste was there, but caste was not the major mode of social structure until the British identified, oh, this is the Indians are having caste. And similarly, when they ruled that they, okay, when they, converted the rules like, okay, there are Muslim laws, there are Hindu laws. It is the, during the British period, the laws were converted or, you know, compiled uh, and Muslim laws and Hindu laws got different. So it is often said that it's a very difficult argument, but it is also said that before the British came, there was no communal riot in India. That is which we call the Shampradayik Danga or communal riot, we didn't see it. There were some clashes, as it happens with the neighbors often. There were some clashes, there were some disputes, but the massive massacre or massive riots that we witnessed throughout the colonial period and particularly at the end of the colonial period was not there. It is a creation of the colonial rule. And that, so at that time also another religious change took place that uh, along with the British missionaries also came who also converted some people, mostly the ethnic people, like those indigenous people, like the Lushai, Bom, or the Santos, those people got converted. 
Some local people also got converted, but the proportion is much lower compared to the ethnic people. But the huge demographic change and religious change took place in, during the end of the colonial rule. When the partition of India took place, there's a massive migration, possibly the largest migration in world history when around uh, 10 million people moved from one place to another for life, for good, for lifetime. And that because the partition took place on the basis of religion. And at that time, religion has been used to uh, divide and rule people, to mobilize against each other. And since then, we still see the divisions are there, the communal feelings are there. And often it is argued that that is because of the British policy, but somehow with knowing or without knowing, we adopted that. So what could be the possibilities of at that time? So if we look at the history, the Palas were the Bengali rulers. And this is one of the glorious times of, for the Bengalis, that they were entirely Bengalis. Still, they were secular, they were open, they were friendly to other religions. And during the Muslim rule, we also see the friendliness, we also see the happy and harmonious coexistence of different religions. So this is the tradition for Bengal. The tradition is that we are always existing with each other, living with each other in harmony and in peace. So now the role, but it doesn't mean that they were losing each other's religion. No, they were not losing each other's religion, but they were happily living with their and upholding their religious belief. So now we have to think about how we can revive that tradition of happy coexistence, happy juxtaposition. Possibly the religious leaders could take the lead when they, are, they could refer to the history and also the historians could take the lead, but when they took, uh, refer to the history, when they refer to the, the, script, the scriptural text that, okay, in our religion, this, is, has, this has been said, but there is no way in any religion it has been said to attack the other people, to become repressive to other people. So maybe then we can look at the possibilities. And also we need to be aware that why these uh, mobilizations are being made, why these hatreds are being created, who are ge getting benefited from this. So if you look at that, even this uh, heavy uh, distressed period of the partition, there were many, many stories when people supported each other, when they helped each other. It's not only the story of uh, massacre and sadness, but there are many positive stories too. So this is the time we need to explore the possibilities and that only can be possible if we take a route and trip to the history and open up new possibilities for the future. Thank you.